Um, but today I'm going to talk about fast application development using dependency injection, code first entity framework, and solid design. And I'm also going to use mock at the same time. So we'll see if we can do this, but the main thing I want to have as a takeaway is that there's ways to write code that are different. And if you're doing it, great. If you're not doing it, shame on you. Okay? I want to make sure we understand this. Except, I have often had to deviate from the things I'm going to be espousing today. Sometimes co-developers aren't ready, or they aren't willing, or you're in an environment where you can't do the things you know you should do. However, every time I've had that happen, there's always a cost. So, we're going to try and see if we can do a little story and get an idea to understand that there's a rhythm that makes an awful lot of sense today in terms of writing code. I'm going to use an example in ASP.NET MVC 4, but it's really not a set of topics that is just restricted to that. If you want to do Windows 8, it's a little different, but it's the same concepts. If you want to do a Windows app that's straight using you the old WinForms technology, or you want to use WPF or Silverlight, it's all going to be the same kinds of concepts, and it's the thing that we all know, but we tend not to do, which is decoupled design. We'll see if I can get to the next page. Ah, some context and personal history. In the 1980s, I had an early start in very disciplined C and C++. I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it was a wonderful place to be. And I was one of those goofy guys thinking goofy things around a whole bunch of other people just like me. And we were all trying to beat each other being the goofy guys and be the uber geek. But they paid us. That was the whole thing that was great. They paid us a lot. Um, but one of the things that we had at the time, and I want you to imagine, this was in the days of Unix, 80 to 90 percent of application development we had to do was in control libraries. We used naming habits and we had some very good discipline. This is before objects, but we were really in object-oriented form, but without the tools. And if we didn't write the 80 to 90 percent in libraries that were reused, we didn't get bonuses. So guess what? We did a really good job and it was a very big focus for it. I would assert that today we don't write code that well most of the time. And it turns out we had a little group that usually would beat teams with like 10 times the developers. We'd be better, we'd be faster, much more agile. That was mainly just a mindset of reusability and keeping things under control. Okay. Well, in my past, I played with a lot of embedded things, you know, assemblers and devices and things. But also, when I do application development, I had played around in the Visual Basic days, RAD development. Now Visual Basic, any of you have done that, the old Visual Basic, not the new stuff, um, it was easy to start. It was incredibly fast. And when you hit a wall, you're dead. You know, you're roadkill. Um, and that was either because of complexity, getting outside of the boundaries, like if you had lots of timings and things, it just didn't work very well. So what I was using is I was using like ATL, C, and C++ and doing a lot of my back-end work and just using it as a front-end. And that worked well, but it turns out the complexity jump to go from just Visual Basic to Visual Basic in the back-end is a phenomenal change, right? That wall is not a small one. That's a hard hit. So what happened was it seemed nice, but these integrated frameworks that do everything sometimes get in your way. Um, I looked at MFC and I bounced off it you know, the old C and C++ libraries, it was so stiff that every time something happened and you breathed on it, you'd have to recompile everything, and it was so obscure and so much fight. Um, and people learned that that's, that whole idea of these really stiff frameworks aren't necessarily good because they didn't encapsulate. So you got a little bigger, and there's still programs out like that because nobody can ever change them to something else. They're pretty much stuck. Well, Java, I taught Java, and I started stubbing my toes in official object-oriented land, doing things different from what I did in the old days in like the 80s. But one of the things that happened at that time was Java Beans, and we all learned bad things from Java Beans. These stiff frameworks, it would take you weeks to be able to get something started, right? It wasn't the story. But from that started coming some new ideas. And it came an awful lot from Java, from small talk in places. And the idea of spring, dependency inversion making little components. So there's a spring.net. That came from Java land. I'm not going to use it, but it was out there. Well, in Net and C Sharp, originally things were pretty well coupled, but it turns out Microsoft now has NuGet, which is major cool. 
Microsoft has decoupled components to be able to give you a different style of programming. And I'll tell you what, I really like it. So in terms of the changes, my strong opinions, I love to develop code. And I despise, I want to tell you despise with a big D, I despise debugging. And in particular, when you have legacy code that's written that's pretty well cruddy, and you have to sit there and debug it, which I have to do probably about 50% of my day, I really despise that because it's unnecessary. It shouldn't have happened. And it turns out the cost of debugging is usually about 50 times more than the cost of the original development. What costs 20 seconds of stupidity costs days, right? So testing is not debugging, and I like testing a whole lot better than debugging by an order of magnitude, but it's still not as fun as design and development. So I've had bad experiences with waterfall and overdesign. Bad things have happened with me. I've had really bad experiences with underdesign and hacking. It's the broken window effect. Once something starts going bad, it gets worse and worse and worse. And often people just keep hacking away on it until they have to throw it away and start over again. And if they're not careful, they reinvent the wheel and build that same piece of junk again. So my goal is always control your code at all times. Can't always do that because of realities. And simplify with decoupled components. Okay, so this is kind of just the, the background backdrop. So for today, I'm going to talk very quickly about solid design principles. And these are heuristics. They're just kind of goals of saying, are you going the right direction or not? Ways to look and say, which way do you want to go to? And then the idea of building components. We've learned that inheritance hierarchies, we've learned that rapid application development environments, we have learned that huge inheritance hierarchies of things all are the wrong path. They look good, they start out well, but they dig into some holes you can't get out of. Decoupled components and encapsulation has always, always worked. So I'm going to start with console programs. I'm going to introduce some concepts and change maybe your think. I'm going to do old school because I was old school. And we're going to switch to new modern styles using some of the newer technologies. But it's how we think this important. So I'm going to build this up piecewise. And then when we're all done, I'm going to go into a mature modern app. We're going to do a break before we do this. And this mature modern app is in all its glory and it's got some uglies in there. But it does some very powerful things and it shows you that you can really decouple things and separate, separate ideas if you're willing to do it. And the end result is something that is very scalable, very decoupled, and very powerful. And then that is my ASP.NET MVC program. We're going to show you some decoupling in places like filters in the IIS stack. Um, and then entity framework code first. That's just going to be build on. But it turns out the concepts, Entity Framework really fits this idea, where you're not going to be stuck down by a database. You always want to stay light. OK, solid. A lot of you who've done things in design patterns have seen solid. Single responsibility principle. We don't want Swiss Army knives. If you have a method that does three things, like for example, if we have a controller for a web that in the, in the code has a whole bunch of security code, and then it does some database junk, and then it does some service junk all in the controller method. Those are three completely separate things that shouldn't be in your code. You should have one thing in each piece of code. Classes should do one thing well. Methods should do one thing within the class that's cohesive well. And we tend not to do that. So think about single responsibility. Whenever you start seeing things that do two or three or four things, you probably have things munched together. Open close principle is another one that we really like, where we want to have things open for modification and extension. We can change things, but in particular, once you start pinning down interfaces or the way components work, you want to have closed for modification in terms of you don't want to change interfaces. You can add new ones, that's what they mean by open, but you don't start modifying existing behaviors because you break these contracts, you have a whole lot of hurt. It means contracts are important. Liskov substitution principle sounds pretty fancy. It's the name of person. It means we have interchangeable objects. If an object's exactly like an object, we're satisfying Liskov substitution principle. So polymorphism here is important. But let's do polymorphism on interfaces, not on objects. As soon as we start doing that with inherited objects, goofy things and complexity starts happening. And then interface segregation principle. Do little things instead of big things and have like the interface from hell 
where you've got 500,000 interface methods and most of them don't work. Oh, it'll work sometime here and it doesn't work here, but we just throw them all in the interface. That's not decoupling. And then the last one here is in the solid design principles that have been around, dependency inversion. One of the things we're talking about today, Castle Windsor or Ninjact, or if you want to have Unity, a bunch of others, they're all containers that help us to do dependency inversion. So I'm going to build up to the ideas of dependency inversion and interfaces and how they work, hopefully in a way that makes sense. So, the design patterns. The whole idea, if you look at the design patterns, the story behind the story is they want you to build tinker toys. They want you to build components. We're not talking inheritance hierarchies. We're not talking rapid application development. But we like to separate things with these hard interfaces. Encapsulation everybody loves. It takes monstrous things and turns them into little problems that mere mortals can solve. We'd also have, like to have little problems that we can test easily in isolation that do one thing. So polymorphism with interfaces is great. Polymorphism, when you start doing implementation inheritance, is less good because it turns out you lose encapsulation. It turns out your code becomes more complex and not less so. And then do components over inheritance. These are things pretty much everybody is starting to converge to as best principles. Okay, stupid developer tricks. Notice I'm going to get the code soon, but not yet. Yagni, you ain't going to need it. If you ever look up the history of Yagni, it came out under XP or Extreme Programming. Think about this. That's a very disciplined programming style. You program in pairs, always. You unit test. Always. And by the way, if you unit test well, you have to have decoupled code or you're going to die. Well, that means unit testing is a key principle. And Yagni's assuming it. Decoupled design is assumed for testability or you can't test it. And you have to have testability. That means you've got a very solid decoupled design. So there's no S in Yagni. They're assuming you're not stupid. So... If you're talking about, oh, we don't have to design, we'll just throw in stuff later on. We don't need dependency version, we'll throw it in later on. That's stupid. Okay? Right now, is we can make things decoupled right off the front in about five minutes. So, you ain't going to need it, except you better be smart. Okay? Have you ever seen, oh, it's like the Great White North and Strange Brew the movie. These things were dumb. I'm, I looked at Strange Brew recently and went, oh my gosh. One of the terms they always use was hosers. It's like my idea of redneck, but hopefully this is a term nobody uses anymore. Who knows? But if you believe in Agile without unit testing, you're a hoser. If you think you're doing solid design and you don't have inversion control or you're skipping any of these solid design principles, you're a hoser because you're not doing Agile. You're not doing things in a lightweight form. You're not making things decoupled. You're hacking. Plain and simple. You're just hacking. Now, have I done that recently? Yep. Whenever I didn't have a choice kicking and screaming. But it happens. But there's also no S in stupid for stupid and agile. Okay, so assuming you know how to design and everybody on the team knows how to design. Okay, I'm going to start out old school. At one time, this is the best we knew. So I've got a little application called Windsor Demo. It's console, because I don't want to get into the messy things. It has nothing to do with net, doesn't have to do with WPF, it has to do with all apps. So what I've got is I've got a main program. It's got a main, and that's about it. It's got a bunch of static methods because I'm too lazy and didn't want to make this complex. And it turns out all my functionality is inside my demo lib. It's just a different DLL and a different project. That's a good thing, right? My app's different from my libraries that do the work, and I'd have more libraries for different things. And then I also have a little test project. So notice my test project has to know about my library, because that's where all the work is. And my program has to know about my lib class. And so this is just a little uh, dependency diagram that you can get in uh, Visual Studio, uh, I think, Ultimate. Okay. So what I did old school is, I'm going to have this object called demo top. Let's just pretend it's my business layer that does things. Okay, if I build this old school inside my demo top class, I'm going to build inside it and construct inside. I'm going to do a new, maybe in the constructor or something, I'll do a mangled text to Iver. 
I'll have to tell you what Iber is in just a little bit. So it's a, a way that I learned from some cute girls when I was in college. So I had to learn Iber. It's just like Pig Latin, but different. It has nothing to do with anything. You won't find it on the web, I don't think. But I thought it was great because the girls were cute. Um, and I also have Mangle text to Pig Latin off on the side. And it turns out they had the same signature. Hint, common interface. I also have a mangle number times three, and I'm going to push that away, but it turns out we could do more work on that if we wanted to. And I have a different way to mangle numbers. So we're just going to take in some strings, and we're going to go do junk. Some will be in my top class. So pretend this is a business logic layer. We talk to services, we do something, and then when we're done, we got to massage the results, and we'll do something else. Two sets of actions, one in the top level, one down in the service level. Okay, we want to be able to test there. We want to test easily, we want to build things, and we want to make things incredibly simple and keep it robust so we don't have to keep rewriting our tests and doing all this goofy stuff. So that's the context of what we have. Now, Iver. I want to understand Iver so you can see the code. So if you say things like today, it's Taibo Daibe. Remember, I learned this really well a long time ago. And so what you do is for each vowel, you put an IB before the vowel, and so notice, 2, P is the constant, and so in front of the I, we go IB. Or before the O, we do an IB. So T-I-B-O, Taibo, is 2. Day is Daibe. Okay, so how is it going today? Haibo, Haibiz, Ibid, Gaibo, Ibin, Taibo, Daibe. Okay, Pig Latin. Okay, Pig Latin you can find. Okay, this was just for fun right? But I also have another scrambler in a different class because some people like Iber, some people like Pig Latin. I like Iber and nobody else knows about it. Uh, but Pig Latin, we only scramble a vowel. One, the very first one you find. And the fronts move to the end and you say A, A, Y. So pig is igpe, right? And special, if you have a vowel in the front like egg, you put a way. So it's egg way. I found that out in Wikipedia. Okay, so we're going to make an Iber thing. But this is down the bottom. This is our service. It's a dumb service. This could be like a database doing stuff, or it could be a web service that gives you all sorts of data. In my case, this is an Iber scrambler. It takes text and scrambles it. Okay, so for our demo then. Let's see if I can do some things. In my demo, You will notice here that I have this top class. I'm going to look at this first. Let's see if I can do some things a little better here in terms of spacing. Because I want a unit test. Let's see. It would be nice for me to figure out, what is it, control plus to get things bigger? Uh, in any case, can you read that text? Okay, sorry about that. I was doing some fiddling I probably shouldn't have done. Okay, what we're going to do is I have my two surfaces. I have my mangled text diver. And notice I'm not programming the interface yet. This is old school, right? Inside my top class, my demo top, I've got my mangled text diver. So it's a little object that's going to allow me to mangle text. And I also have a mangle number object. And so what do I do in my constructor? Well, look here. In the constructor now, I build the two objects. Cool, right? This is standard old school. We build the objects and we're abstracting things, right? Top doesn't know about it, just calls this top class. And we build things in this form, right? Inside is contained. Now imagine, if this is a database, I'm hiding the database behind this stuff. But I'm building the database access point inside here. Well, in terms of my display top, we're just going to worry about the the, the text method here. I have something called scramble text. And this code should be pretty easy to figure out. What I do is I have this text to scramble coming in. And I look at the first character. So if you see here what's happening, I look at the first character. And if it's uppercase, I flip a flag and say, yep, it's uppercase. And I hold it. And if it's a numeric or anything else, then it's not an uppercase. And so I've got a little if thing. If it's an uppercase first letter, I turn everything to uppercase when I'm done. 
Notice I'm not doing much complicated. I'm either converting all uppercase or all lowercase when I'm done. And in the middle, I'm going to call the scrambling thing, right? So I've got this text to mangle. Well, I got a number thing, but I don't want to focus on this. So remember, part of our behavior here, this might be business logic. We got some data and now we got to convert it to whatever form we think we need. Okay, so now we're going to go into our wonderful classes here. Down in the bottom level, we have our mangle text to Iber. Now you'll notice I've got some goofy things here, if you look at it. One of the goofy things is I have the static integer count. This is not thread safe. It's not even trying to be thread safe, but since I'm doing this off a single thread, who cares? This is demo code. This is not an example on how to do threading. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm keeping a track of the number of objects. And this is going to be useful for later on for dependency injection containers. But for right now, we don't care about it. I'm just keeping a count. If I have three objects, it counts 0, 1, 2. But now we have our Iber code. My mangle text, I have a working string. I find my vowels, upper and lowercase, because I was just lazy. And this is just a quick way to do it. And you'll notice in my for each loop, if I've got a vowel, I throw in my ib at the end. So I just assemble that ib, and I keep assembling the string as I go. And when I'm all done, I throw that Iber result back when I'm finished. Okay, so this will do all that. Today goes into Taibo Daibei. Everybody catch that? So my bottom class is pretty wimpy. Pig Latin is going to actually have the same kind of method. I've got a thing called mangle. So for the Pig Latin, let me get to Pig Latin. When we do this, that was not good. We have the same signature mangle. I'm begging for an interface, and actually I wrote it with the interface and they stripped it all off so you can see this demo. Okay, so this is one where, again, I've got my vowels, and it turns out Pig Latin took a little bit more code, but basically I'm, I'm doing the, the case of if it starts with a vowel, then I throw in the way, and if not, I just do the modifications. But this is just my Pig Latin algorithm. Wow, right? Now, old school, if I was doing this, I always cared about testing code. So what would we do? Well, if it was not in the console, I'd write a little console wrapper. Notice I got one DLL, I can do a console wrapper, and I'm going to go test it in the console. So, inside my app level, I got a program. And what do I do? I can test Iber directly. Because the bottom level is easy, right? It has no dependencies. We throw in a string, it goes and does something, it mangles it up. And I can test the Iber directly, and I can test. The other stuff. So I've got a couple functions. They're statics because I'm not caring much about object things here. And I'm just basically throwing in that text string I just said. So remember in Iber, hi there, how is it going today? Goes into hi bow, uh, thy bear, hi bow, i biz, i bit, guy bow, i bing, tie bow, die bay. Okay? That's what we should see when we're done. And I go look at that text and make sure it says the right thing. I actually did this thing. Can you imagine me talking to myself? Um, and then I also have a pig Latin thing that tests with the same string. And I'm sorry, I don't know pig Latin as well, so I'd have to think about this a little more carefully. But we can go run this, and since we're running this as two tests, notice I decoupled it a little bit, because at the end we know the test is going to go away. This is old school. We test it, but at the end I'm going to have to toss my results out. So let's go execute this. Let's start without debugging. Wild and crazy. And you notice... Hi, and Iber goes to hi by. There goes to thy baribi, right? Each letter gets modified. So if I didn't say it right, thy baribi. Uh, how, hi bow. So I'd be just testing this when it all looks good and I throw in a bunch of different text strings and such. And I'd say, I'm happy and I throw this away and I don't touch my code. Okay, that's good because I'm testing, but the problem is I got to throw this away. Bummer. So this is old school and this works. Let's go back to a presentation here really fast and then go to kind of the next level. Would it be better to keep our tests and retain them? This is the next level up, right? So what we saw is we can swap the text and numeric methods in code. So if I wanted to swap from Iber to one, I'm hardwiring everything in there. And it turns out I didn't test the top class. 
Think about why I didn't test the top class. If the top class is calling the Iber thing, I got that variant, and if it's calling one of the two number classes, I've got to put it into the code, and I've got to change the code. So not only is it not persistent, but I'm changing things in the fly just to test the darn thing. I used to do that all the time when we're done, say, yeah, I've tested all my different scenarios. I document it on the side, and we say we're done. Now, that's lame. So test messages are throwaway code. Can we do something about that? And separating libraries from apps is very good because my program was separated from all my working code. And that's a nice thing, which means that my app just kind of says, call the top class and go run yourself. That's all we really need. Okay, so for better things, we do unit tests. We're going to create tests that are separate from our code in the application. Microsoft does this easily. So those of you who don't do this, shame on you. Uh, the tests are something we continue to use, but we're going to dig ourselves into holes. So the moral at the bottom is, I can test the very bottom, but that middle class is going to be a stinker because either I'm going to do all this combinatorial nightmare, and if I change anything in the whole hierarchy, imagine if I had 20 classes that this one class calls, any of those 20 classes change it, I'd have to change my tests. That's not going to work. I used to try that, and it's lame and it's dumb, and you say unit tests are stupid. Okay. So one of the problems we have is we can now focus on test methods. Those end methods, mangle text to Iber on the top. I can test that easily, right, because it has no dependencies. So we're just going to do this. We're going to see unit testing. And mangle text to pig Latin would work. And then those other ones for mangling numbers that I'm ignoring, those also would work. So what we do is we create a new project. And all we have to do is create a unit test project. We have to reference our library. Uh, that's not very tough, is it? And then for attributes, we have a bunch of attributes. Test class for a class, we just put these annotations. This is stinking easy. So what happens is, by reflection, we go in, and the, the test runner basically looks for every class with a test class on it, and it looks for test initialized. That's code that's going to be run before each test, and test cleanup. So I can set things up and clean up every time for a test so I don't have to write it. I'm lazy here. And that's what people who wrote unit tests did. They want to be lazy so we can write the same tests I did, not make them throw away, and make them reproducible and give us diagnostic information so somebody else can come in and use them. Okay, and habits tend to help, but it's arrange, act, and assert. So if we go back into this, into our application, I have a little test project <coughs> under test. Ooh, I'm in the wrong one. Bad, bad. I'm still in a test project. And I didn't name this very excitingly. But you notice I've got something called test class. So I built my test class. I referenced my, main, uh, my library off in the references. And I'm going to build an object. I'm going to have an instance method of my pig, pig Latin object that I'm going to test. I'm going to have an instance of my Iber object. And the reason why is because I'm going to keep setting up, keep it as an instance, and then tear it down when I'm done. And I'm going to write a bunch of little tests. Okay. And so the initialization part is I build a new pig Latin object, and I build a new Iber object. There's no state here, so I made it extra simple. And for tear down, I just set them to null. So each time I'm getting a new virgin case so I don't have unit test screw up. Okay, this is really wimpy wussy. I know. And then for the test now, naming convention is very important. We make sure we annotate the method, and it's just a little void thing, and we're going to call it test method. And what we do is we set things up. Since we already have those objects ready to go, I'm just going to set how, right? Remember, that should be highbow if it's iber. And this is a mangle text to iber. Well, what I do is call my Iber object and say mangle text, throw some text in, which is my how, and I'm going to assert that the end result, oops, this one I'm going to do, sorry, the, the very first test, I should see highbow. Okay, so we're going to run that test. I'm going to test a couple of other things. Notice my tests here are just asserting R equal. If the two values aren't equal, I have a test fail. Down below, I have a more interesting test. For some things that are null, you notice I have a couple of other annotations here where we can have some stuff where what happens if we have an exception, a null exception or, or things. So we can annotate things and say, oh, we're expecting an exception or not an exception depending on what kind of thing's happening. And it turns out right now there's an inconsistency. In one case, if I have a null input, one of them works 
and one of them throws an exception. So I'm inconsistent between my two objects. Remember they're supposed to be exactly the same? They're not. They're almost exactly the same. But if I go run this, I can debug through and see what's going on, but I can do my tests. And we just go run through these tests. I'm going to just run, sorry, I can use the keyboard shortcuts, but notice I'm just stupid about this. I'm going to get to all tests, yeah. Come on. The shortcut is control R A. I wasn't going to do that. And notice off on the side we have our unit test passing. And notice I named the tests. I also put an 01, 02, 03, 04, and I made the same order as my code. So when I read the code, I can figure out where things are. Little things like this are going to make your tests a lot easier. Okay, piece of cake here. It's the same thing I did before, the rhythm's different. All we're doing here is we're just saying, instead of doing my tests and making a throwaway, put a different project. Whoop! Does that cost much more? Actually, it doesn't, and the value here is much higher. The problem, though, is that if I want to test that next level up, my top level, I'm thoroughly toasted, right? There is no way to do it, and the problem is that I wrote my code stupid. And so we dug ourselves in a hole, and a lot of times people will bounce off. So, going on then, let's see if we can do something a little different. So, test methods are persisted. By that next layer, I can't test just that piece of code by itself without my dependencies. I'm going to make some changes. So the best approach is, we like to do inversion of control, IOC, and mocking is good because it actually makes it easy to write tests very quickly instead of writing all these test classes. Because once we have an interface, I could write test class after test class after. That's going to be boring. Wouldn't it be nice to just build something on the fly really fast that works? But we're going to also have to change a couple things. So in version of control, what I'm going to change is before my demo top, which I haven't really used, and it's the one that does the uppercase, lowercase, it built the objects inside. Now instead, we're going to insert the objects in the constructor. And that's one of the best ways to do it, constructor injection. You can do it other ways, but I don't care for now. So if we have an interface, I demo mangle text, my mangle text to iber conforms to it, so I'm going to have to use the interfaces. And I can swap these two objects, and all of a sudden now my demo top is doing something very simple. First of all, as I've decoupled, and it turns out unit testing here is my coupling smeller. Before what happened was I didn't even try to test because it would be so smelly. My unit testing is really more than anything telling me that uh, I've got myself a coupling problem. As soon as you have a coupling problem, you have yourself a code problem. So it's a detection for a problem. Well now, if I do a couple changes, I insert this code and insert it by interfaces. First I'm decoupled, and second of all is I can test easily. It's telling me my design is right and I'm not going stupid. So DI container just makes it easy in your program. Your test doesn't need a dependency injection container. Only your program does. So remember when I have my top level program? That or some infrastructure is the only place I need to have my injection container. So like Ninject or whatever, that's where I'm going to put it. But the first part here is using that inversion of control. So an inversion control dependency injection container creates objects, it resolves dependencies, and controls object lifetime. How long? So you can have disposal taken care of automatically for you. And everything done right so an application programmer just programs. Uh, some examples of these are SpringNet, uh, Castle Windsor, the one I'm going to show at least in the early demos, Ninject, which I'll show at the very end, and then like Object Builder, and then you had a wrapper on it, Unity is kind of the Microsoft one. And there's also MEF, which is almost a dependency injection container. Okay, and this has also evolved. In the old days, everybody said, do this in XML, because it's completely decoupled. And it turns out it is, takes forever to get this going. But it turns out, we start out with these XML configuration files to be able to configure our container. Now we use Fluent Interfaces. So if you screw up and don't do the interfaces right, it blows up in your face code-wise on compile, and you get a much faster turnaround. And that's becoming your best habit. So if you ever see all the old documentation saying XML configuration, throw it away. Find the Fluent Interface. And if you want to find faster ways to do it, get comfortable with Fluent first. OK, Castle Windsor is the one I'm going to pick to start today, just because I've never used it before, and I'm glad I picked it. 
as part of the castle project and there's a couple cool things i can't show you this today there's something called dynamic proxy with dependency injection dynamic proxy allows you to build a wrapper object so you can wrap the front and the end of every method call so if you want to do performance on the fly you just dynamically build it up in your container, add one line of code to your proxy, you can all, all of a sudden have a performance counter to find out how long it takes you to go through the code, and you didn't change your code at all. At all. All you change is your build. And you can do this dynamically. Um, if you want to, for example, find the SQL that's being emitted by entity, you could put that back behind. It's not part of your code. But you could sit with dynamic proxy and all of a sudden turn this thing on and see all your SQL statements and then do, you know, copy them over and do some perf tools on uh, SQL Server Management Studio, piece of cake, and you don't have to modify your code base. And since this is integrated in with your dependency injection container, you can put in interceptors or this code, um, aspect-oriented code kind of idea very quickly and easily in, and you kept it separate from your main code and kept it clean. So... Fluent configuration is where I'd say to go, but there's other methods like DLL discovery. You'll go in the DLL and find all the different methods, and you can do searching and discovery. And there's, Most of the dependency injection containers can do this. So for Castle Windsor, start with the Fluent interface. Typically, you can figure this in a bootstrapper. I'm not. I'm just doing, going to do it real quickly. Um, so if you're in like a WPF app, you put in the bootstrapper to build everything up, and then you start by your bootstraps and the way you get going. In ASP.NET, there's a dependency resolver interface, and what happens is you're building your application chain. When you're using dependency injection and you build an object, it's building all the sub-objects and all the sub-objects and all the sub-objects through the constructors. So you just call one object and away it goes and it resolves itself. That's the preferred approach, but you can cheat. So create a container, register or configure components and startup, and then at the end you resolve it. Those are the only three things you're going to do, and this is for all the containers. So now, switching through things. Ha, I'm in the right spot. What I've done is before, if you remember, in my lib project, I only had items. Still have the same items, but if we look at these items now, like mangle a number, notice now I'm using an interface. Each method has a corresponding interface. And let's go look at the Iber one just for fun. All right, the Iber one has an iDemo mangler. If we go to definition, it has a display text mangler. Just something to say, here's the object I'm in. So if I swap objects, I know which one I'm at. And then I have this little mangle method, right? And it's the one that takes text and turns it into the Iber text or turns it into the pig Latin text. So now I've got polymorphism and I also have decoupling. And unit testing as a smeller is going to say, I've stayed decoupled. So if you have a service layer talking to your data layer and you're not talking through interfaces, that's an example of a characteristic type of, of system that should use interfaces. Anytime you're between layer boundaries. Or if you're going to like data access boundaries, like you're going to your DAO component or whatever. It's usually best to use interfaces at those things because that gives you your swappability. Otherwise, you're programming directly through components and you're starting to get heavy coupling. So now once we've done this, then if we look at my demo top, that's the thing that's really changed here a little bit. And all I did was I put two parameters in my constructor. I used the interfaces, and now I'm injecting in the two components. That's it. That's inversion of control. That's all we wrote. But now there's so much more we can do. So because of this now, we can change our testing. We can change the way we do things. And, and this is really the only change that we've done. Is we added interface. And then in this one that has dependencies, we put the dependencies in as interfaces. Right? We have inversion of control now. Now our testability changes pretty dramatically. So in my test project, I can actually do a mangle text or, or a mangle or demo top unit test. Get that right. Now, one of the things that happens is we could write those classes, but that's going to be a bit of a pain. So there's some other tricks that we can start adding in. Whatever I did, it was dumb. There we go. So now if we're looking at this code, 
One of the things for a test method for my start, I'm doing a little bit more than I have in the past. The first thing is I'm building a mock object. This is MOQ mock, the mocking framework. Wonderful thing. What happens is mock.object is the fake object. And what happens is by default, things will return default values. Like if it's expecting strings, probably null string. If you're expecting a value, probably zero. And you can override things on the fly, but it basically takes your interfaces and then builds an object that satisfies your interface on the fly. Cool, huh? So what we do is I'm building a new mock object for my demo mangle text interface. So it'll support all those methods. And that's my mock text object. My mock text object, I set it up and I'm gonna take one of those methods and you remember I'm passing in a string. So as long as I pass in a string, I'm gonna return the same value back. I'm just gonna return the string value. If there's no parameters, it's even easier. And that's all you have to do for mock object. I just sat there and I tacked up a quick little method on the fly and it's gonna fake my object, but it's gonna give me consistent results. So no matter what my sub dependencies do, this is always gonna do the same thing. And I'm only testing my class that uses the dependencies. Okay. So at the end then, in my test initialize, I build the object and notice this seems a little goofy. I'm doing my mock object dot object because that's where the actual object is. The rest is kind of the wrapper part that does all the fun stuff for you. I'm just casting it over. And I probably should put a test in there, but whoop, I don't care. And doing the same thing with the other test. And so this is just a way to build up my two little mocks. And so the test class I'm caring about now has a two mocked objects. One for numbers, and transfer number is always going to return 21. If it has 11 in. If it doesn't, it's going to return the default value, but I'm not going to use this one. So I'm going to use the text one and play with it. Okay, so we just saw mocking pretty quick. And at the end, we're just going to clear this junk up. And notice now, I'm just going to show you two little tests. Remember, all we did was if it was uppercase, transfer into uppercase. If it's lowercase, do it to lowercase. And we probably would care if it was null or numeric or spaces and junk. But I'm not going to do those. Once we have this object, we're saying test stop scramble text. Uh, tie a yellow ribbon. Okay, I'm passing that in. No matter what, I'm getting tie a yellow ribbon. Remember what we mocked it to? Tie a yellow ribbon comes back out. And so since it's capitalized, it should turn it to uppercase. And so that's what I'm testing. The next case, I'm doing tie a yellow ribbon down below. And notice I'm naming it for what I'm doing and just say, it should give me a lowercase result. Well, when we go test this now, yeah. I'm gonna do well. Control R A, I was trying to do that. Demo top uppercase and lowercase are satisfied. Remember, there's hardly any behavior in here. All the complexity would have been in its dependencies. We have a class that does one thing well, converts to upper lowercase depending on the first letter. And we have a surface that does whatever the service does, and now we have these tested in isolation. This scales. If you have 20 dependencies, same thing. If everybody gets this idea. So you're only testing units of code or classes of code in isolation by doing this, which is inversion of control, mocking just makes it simple, and testing frameworks. And now we have something persistently there. And the only time these tests are gonna change is not if the environment changes, but if we change our code. It also is telling us we have something decoupled. We're programming the interfaces. So no matter what happens outside, this is doing our one thing. And we're expecting a contract coming out. This has legs and it's a different flow. I would assert once you get comfortable with this, it is no slower than the normal way you do it old school. Okay. Last part though, is I never did anything on dependency injection, did I? Okay, this is also gonna be very easy. Remember, mock is gonna be only your testing framework. The libraries you're testing, it doesn't need anything, right? They're just libraries that do library things. In our main program is where we care about dependency injection or in some sort of infrastructure that main would call. You know, your bootstrapper, your setup, whatever it's going to be. And so in here, I've got a couple things where I could actually test it old school way if we cared about it. And the advantage is if we have complicated hierarchies, my setup container, this is stinking easy. NuGet, 
getting yourself Castle Windsor, include a couple references at the top of your code, and you build a container called a Windsor container, and then you call a couple of register methods. So what we're doing is I'm registering my demo text, we're registering um, a couple of implementations here, and my demo top, and it turns out if I build a demo top object, it'll resolve this dependency through the constructor automatically. So if I have chains of objects calling objects calling objects, if you build up your code, this is just going to work. So this is a dependency injection container. Um, almost all of them look the same if you're using the Fluent interfaces. And most of them today have a Fluent interface. And that's it. So if you notice, the concept is the tough part. The injection container is a piece of cake. Okay, let's take a break and I'm going to do some things in code and we'll just go kind of as long as we think it's useful. So about five minutes and I'm going to switch into an ASP.NET MVC application. Most of these are to keep me nice and on focus. In ASP.NET, one of the places you start as a chain, if you're doing things right, there is a cheat and um, the person who wrote dependency injection for net marks somebody and I can't think of his last name now and I'm ashamed of that, has mentioned that if you use service locator, it's kind of an anti-pattern. It's so easy and so stinking smelly that you can get yourself in a couple holes. Been trying to avoid it, but we do have a service locator in this. Um, but most of the time, the way you should do things pure is like if you're doing Prism, let's say WPF or Silverlight, you should build modules. And the modules, the, the chain of the module building should build everything down the line where the arguments you pass in with inversion control will resolve the entire application. It's like you make the first call and it builds itself. Well, in ASP.NET MVC4, when you build a controller, that's where you get started. Everything builds from the controller, so the controller has arguments and the dependencies are passed in arguments. That's not the general way to do it. And then all the arguments, let's say you put in a service, and the service has arguments and is passed in as parameters. As long as it's configured in your injection container, you just configure it. It builds this whole chain of objects for you, and it does it in one place. So the, the place that you inject things in is called the dependency resolver interface on the IIS stack. So every time you get a request, you build up a controller. And when you build up the controller, there's a spot where you can switch out the dependency resolver, and that's where we attach our dependency injection container. Okay? And once we got the dependency injection controller container, we can have controllers with arguments in them. Hopefully interfaces, right? That's a good thing. Or POCO objects. Usually interfaces or POCO objects that are just data are the two ways to do it. Because why have an interface for something that's just data? I've got an I app data of type string. And then we've got a string I app data that's the same thing. That's just goofy, right? So you can have POCO objects, but then you're starting to have anemic objects without behaviors. So the whole idea is when things come in, you route to a controller. The dependency resolver can see the arguments and build up the controller to start your dependency injection train. That's the way we get started in MVC. Okay, DI setup, I'm not going to care about the details, but this is going to be using an inject. Fluent interface is so much the same, but since everything is based on a controller, we're either going to care about static lifetimes most of the time, or we're going to care about request lifetimes. From the time when you start the controller build up, to the time when you're done should be your lifetime, which means we don't even have to get rid of our objects and call dispose for disposable things. It will dispose for you automatically. That's a huge improvement. So there's lifetimes on these objects. I wasn't showing much for the for actually in testing these objects, but it turns out most of the time they're going to default to like a singleton or a per instance type of thing and you have to override if you want to change it. So for Castle Windsor, the default was a singleton. You built one object and when you did it three or four times when you ran the program, it was the same darn object. If you make it a transient instance, then each time it's a new object. You can name the objects, it's all these variants, but you play with it and you find out. Okay, so the whole idea here is that we build some decoupled components and you configure it all in and we have it in a couple of different DLLs. That's the moral of the story. But the whole idea is like for a web layer, the web layer can talk to the business layer and the business layer can talk to the data or to shared projects, but it turns out they have no interfaces at all between them. They can just call, or sorry, they have no direct 
access. They can only talk through interfaces. In fact, the DLLs don't even reference each other. Can you imagine this? The business layer talks, the business layer talks to a data layer and it can't even reference the data layer object. So that way there's no way to tunnel through and accidentally play around and do data things when you shouldn't in a business layer. So this is a way to enforce the kind of behaviors we want. So a programmer does the right thing in a decoupled way and they're gonna have to work to do the wrong thing. And as soon as we do it, we can look at a layer diagram and dependency kind of diagram within you know, Visual Studio and instantly say, you screwed up, you tunnel through. Sh stop it, don't do that. Yes. Um, that's actually a good question. The question was, if I have dependency injection, don't I have to have it for the chain? With an XML file, no. And it turns out the infrastructure is the one place when you build it up. And if all you do is build up that, if you move it to an infrastructure project, and that's where it's good, and the infrastructure now has to link to everything. This is kind of like the, the central master switcher. Or what you can do is you can have it scan all the DLLs and all your projects, and that's another way to do things traditionally, and have it find all the interfaces and build things up that way. And that's more decoupled, so each DLL or project knows what it's doing, and it has its right references, and you're just calling it. Those are the two approaches, okay? And so originally the decoupling was less important than they thought it was. Okay, but if you have your main program, call an infrastructure that just builds things up and comes back, and nobody else touches that code, you're safe. But you can't get rid of it unless you have something like an XML where you're just completely moving out of the code space or you do this reflection-based approach. Any other questions here? Okay. I think I'm near done. Cool. Now to look into code. This is one where I've got some unit tests and maybe we just look at the unit tests to start out. This is an application and if you think about it, the worst place, the worst place to test is going to be your controller. Because it does everything, right? It knows about everything. It gets started with everything. So if there's any dependencies in there that you've hardwired, your unit tests are pretty well toast. So what I've got in tests is I have under controllers just one test. And this is my canary. The only purpose for these tests here was to make sure that this application is decoupled and people hated me because every time these tests failed, it meant we hardwired something. We had to redesign something to keep it decoupled, which is the whole goal of what we're trying to do for projects. So developers automatically have things decoupled in the right way. So if we notice, I've got lots of things. For, for loggers, we kind of cheated. There are people who would scream about this, but notice I have something called iLogger. Whenever we have logging, it's through an interface. So we've got ourselves a facade over a logger and an interface that just allows you to log. It doesn't do much. Um, so we don't have an implementation, but we can swap into a stub logger or we can mock a logger, whatever we want to. So that means if we want to run things locally or build up a controller where we don't actually go through a logger instance, we can just test the application code itself. Yeah, it does make a difference. Or we can dependency inject it in and do our construction tree. So testing can be completely separate from our execution path. I want to keep that clear. Can't say it, but want to keep it clear. We also have security. Security is where we, app who the, uh, where we uh, wrap who the user is and what they can do, their roles, their capabilities. And it turns out we won't even have it in the code. We're going to have it as an attribute. And the attribute is early on in the stack. When you get a request, the first things you go through are the authentication authorization filters in the IIS stack and it turns out that's where your attribute goes and so you basically we're going to set some attributes on top of the method to say oh you can look at this you can't look at that and it turns out this is hiding whether we stub security which is a really dumb object or we have full security going through a claim system because we started this without claims and so we can keep this separate we can test the application in a confined environment, turn things on and off very easily and make sure it works. And when claims comes in or you use web forms authentication or whatever you want to, it doesn't make any difference. You can change this because it has nothing to do with the app. It is completely separated. Single responsibility, right? Not code plus security plus user. Code, security, separated. And since they're dependency injected, they're swappable. Ooh. Okay, so notice I have this idea, I'm stubbing security for unit tests, and I've got a mock locator, which is my service locator. 
that's the one that would be considered kind of bad, right? A service locator is kind of like the big dump for things. And instead of doing it through a chain, we can then just dump objects in there that can be resolved. And it's a way to have a global if you're not careful. So pure is to do a chain. This is a way that's really so tempting that as long as you're very careful and disciplined around it, you can do it. But I just say, whenever you see a service locator, be very careful how it's used because it can be abused. And you have to go deep into the readings to care about it, and I don't want to go that far, but just warning, service locators, I'm using it here, but it's dangerous. Okay, so what happens is we got a controller talking to a service, a service talking to our database, and right now the service is so wimpy, it just proxies through the database, and the database does stuff in any framework. So what we're doing is we have our service locator, we pull out our services, and what we've done is we've set up namespaces so we can't talk directly to the database because we can't get the interface. The interface is hidden away, which is that problem you talked about of everybody knowing about everybody else. So we're encapsulating the major layers and the one place infrastructure knows about everything. And that's the only place and nobody should be coding there except who set up the framework. Okay, but these tests actually work where we're going all the way through the database and testing different scenarios in terms of pages that we can build a controller, do all our work and all the context and all the normal web things are hidden away. Either we put a facade over the top and abstract it or we're dependency injecting and hiding away and putting it through interfaces. So if I go through the unit tests and famous last words, let's see them blow up. I actually got to work that time with the mouse. All my tests are running, which means so far I'm completely decoupled from building most of my controller methods. Security is on the outside, everything else is on the outside. Cool. Well, if we look at a few things here, at a top level for a controller, we'll just kind of take a couple of controllers. That's going to be in my web project. This is all my front end stuff, and so it's kind of big. So if we go in controllers, all the requests go to a controller. And I've got a Kendo demo controller, one of the places that we can see. And we have it inheriting from app controller. I tend to hate inheritance, but we got a few simple things. App controller is very thin. Um, and we do have a service locator. Notice that cheat. Instead of passing in like all the dependencies and doing a dependency chain, we're doing the big dump with the service locator for all the storage of things. It made it simpler. And I lost. I wanted it the other way. Um, and we're calling a base service to be able to store this away and put it in some appropriate things. But then for all our action methods then, I want you to look very carefully. Up above, there's an app authorized attribute. This is an attribute we made. Now the thing is, attributes have to be classes. They can't be an interface. Darn. So how do we program abstractly when you have to program to a class? Well, one way would be to inherit from this class and use it as a base class. Still kind of lame because you're trying to call a specific class, so that's not going to work too well. How about this class calls a component inside that has an interface? That's the trick you tend to use in the filters. So you have to do a class. There's some ways to put some information and transfer, and I don't want to bore you with the details, but you can actually take the filters on this, and for example, we could keep like... Uh, only a person who's uh, administrator. We can put the administrator property on this and now we're going to be able to switch out inside our class and we build this up then with our dependency injection container. Okay, we can also have attributes like logging. So the logging one just says we're going to do a standard log every time we get into this method. And it's using our stub logger or an actual logger. So we can swap out our loggers on the fly and all we have to change is one place which logger we're using for our application. Now if you're using uh, the idea of aspect-oriented programming, we could use interceptors and make that even cooler. Okay, Just think about that. If you haven't seen interceptors or castle dynamic proxy, look at it, please, because you're going to find out some cute things you could do in production that are really valuable and allow you to take existing code and modify it to be able to meter it and test it and do different things. Okay, um, I can also put some properties like the log level I can set up for a warn. But notice in most cases what's happening is I've got some services and like for example, what's happening is my controllers can talk to my service layer or my business logic layer and the business logic layer can talk to the database 
right now, since it's just a thin pass through, this is pretty wimpy. But what I'm doing is because of the way we got things in the constructor is being dependency injected in. And what we're using for this is Ninject. Uh, let's see if there's anything else exciting in here. Not too much. Uh, we had to do some very sophisticated things for some of the grid methods for Ajax. I had to use dynamic types for that. Um, more interesting is I think in the user demo controller. Ha! If we don't put an attribute on there, right now there's no security. So any method that's not marked has no security at all. Easy to audit. Not necessarily the best thing for a default behavior. But notice here we have an app authorized filter with an admin string. This string is being passed and unless you have administrator access, you don't see it. Well, our menu by reflection looks for this attribute, and if it's there, and there's, you don't have the privilege, and it uses that same system with dependency injection, you don't even see the menu item. So you can't get to this. This isn't even the controller. You don't even get to the controller. This attribute is early on, on the early filters, so you never execute and build a controller if you don't have that privilege. You can't go to square one. This is tight security, and notice all your security is outside of this code. And the code is now calling services to do its work instead of writing a lot of code in the controllers. So the way we've got this set up, if you have a list of things, any of those things in the list are ORed. So you can say, oh, if I'm an admin, if I'm a user special or something, if you stack them up, they're ANDed. So we can have any security we want and it's very easy to validate if you have the correct security for the appropriate methods. You can put them on a controller or you can put them on an action here. And this is done through dependency injection. Okay, so if we look through here, see a couple of things on inject. We have this mainly in our infrastructure away from our main apps and our main pathway. So in, in here we have inject web common on our infrastructure DLL. This is the one that has to know about everything else. I did it again. Shame on me. And you will see in here, we have an inject common. And we have ourselves a start. And remember, it's a little bit different. Here we have dy dynamic module utility register module. And we do a couple things and we initialize our bootstrapper. And we have something called a kernel object. It turns out there's two layers in inject that's different from Castle Windsor. But the bottom line is when we create our kernel, we're going to do some configuration of things and we can register our services. So our mainline services here, we do kernel.bind. That's the same thing as the old registration we saw in Castle Windsor. This is setting up, if you see an interface, here's your object. If you see an interface, here's your object. That's all we're doing for pattern here. I don't want to go through the details. But one thing that's very important is we can set things up in terms of the lifetime in terms of how long they last. And I don't remember where that is in terms of the details. Uh, the filter ones are stinkers here. If you see this bind filter, those are the ones that are much nastier. You have to have two classes to get a filter to work. And then inside the filter, you got some other tricks you want to play with. But the whole idea is you're configuring things. So when an object is created, you have control of the, the object, control of the lifetime. Okay, that's just the moral of the story here. The rest is just details. We also, since we cheated, we have this big global thing that's our service locator. And we also configure our service locator. We have something locate a service, so we dump bunches of services in here on the fly, and this is the one that gets figured a whole bunch. But once we've done this, everything's set up, everything's decoupled, service layer doesn't have to talk to our data layer. Now, in our data layer, we have data interfaces, and we have a standard repository, standard unit of work. Remember, unit of work allows you to save things, and it's still a wrapper on top of DB context, which really is its own repository also. But if we went to Azure or whatever, those details would be hidden. If we went to something else in terms of database with different details, we got ourselves a bridge or a facade over the top that allows us to change it. And the thing is, that gives us code longevity beyond about two, three years. Because if you've noticed, Microsoft tends to change their data systems behind things about every two, three, four years. Okay, if that's the lifetime of your project, then you're fine. If not, you ought to think about putting something in front of it. Okay, but since we have these interfaces, those are things that we can kind of pull out. Very common things. 
our actual data now has defined a few things and we actually have inside our data our actual DB set repository that has stuff. DB set repository of type T. Okay, not terribly exciting. In common, we have our model. And we made some author things, and here are two entities. If we're going to do a code first entity, by default, you're going to use local DB. So you don't even have to have a connection string if you're using code first with Entity Framework 5. All you have to do is just make your DB set and it'll go to local DB and away you go. If you set up SQL Server Compact and you configure to use SQL Server Compact, it'll put into a bin file your SQL Server file and it'll create it on the fly if you have sometimes data initializers. So all this happening here is if you're used to Entity Framework, you normally build some sort of model mapping or you go from the database and build your big meta model and everything else. Um, in, in Code First, you build your classes, you make sure they're, they're known by DB context, that's all you really have to do, and then you annotate your classes or you write some side code to be able to put your appropriate attributes, like what's an index, how it works, and some of the details about it. And what happens is this will build a database on the fly for you. But we can have different initialization strategies if we want to. So what we've done here is we've got authors and books, nothing terribly exciting about this, and it turns out those two sets of tables are built. And if we wanted to, we could use code first to build up our whole framework. And when we're all done, we can take that database that was generated, reflect off it, and build a database project. And we can use that to build a traditional database model if you want to use that kind of code flow. Bottom line is make sure your database artifacts are under version control. There's no reason not to do it. Use a code first flow or use a database project and you know a standard model first kind of, or sorry, uh, database first kind of entity framework flow. So it's really not terribly difficult, but in our database set repository, got a context, setting some things up. I don't know if there's any questions. I don't want to really belabor this because I think most of us have seen ad nauseum different kinds of repositories. But the whole idea right now is we can go and initialize things if we want to, and I'll see if I can find that initialization stuff. But um, if I go and run this for the application, we have this configured. This is just a little landing page. It's responsive. Whoop. Right now is this is a page. Our landing page is a demo thing. And the way I've got this initialized right now is this is using kind of a code first initialization strategy to seed things. So as I change my data, I got to change my seeding, but I'm doing this in code, it's very rapid turnaround. So if I change my structures, change the code a little bit, way we go. And right now is I've got some data that's being generated and just an authors in a book grid. They actually have many, many, but I'm not displaying it, big whoop. Change configuration file. This will then seed an MDF kind of file. Okay. Um, change the seed. You can change, you know, the data source of where you're going. You can go from an MDF file to um, the SDF file for for the SQL Server Compact kinds of things. Very easy to change. And the cool part here is that, like the menu options on this screen, like this admin or admin user. I've got a stub user right now that's being used. And if I change my privilege, I could change the menu options and I really can't fudge and I can't get to any of these action methods automatically built in. So what we've got right now by decoupling is that users can only do, or sorry, application developers can only do the right thing unless they work really hard at it. And if they do, it's easy to see those things where they've tried to bypass the system. Lifetimes are automatically taken care of Security are stuck into attributes, and we use dependency injection to get those attributes into the right place at the right time. Security is much stronger, and it's easy to audit and say what the security is, where if you munch this in with a code, it's almost impossible to figure out what your security structure is unless you go to huge headstands to try and figure out where you're going. So I guess what I'd say for the moral is, you can actually separate uncomfortable things. If you can separate who a user is and user authentication completely from the application, and it turns out the claims authentications, the configuration file change is pretty massive, 
but it turns out you can actually have that completely separate from the application itself. You don't recompile, and now you can switch to a claims-based authentication. That'll be what you'll see in December. Or we can stub it and run it locally, and we don't care what's going to happen because we've defined the interfaces. We also can do the same things in terms of logging, and then we've separated different layers so we cannot communicate without going through handstands. Let's say straight from a controller. There is no way right now for the app to go from a controller to the data without munching through and then setting up different dependencies directly, and you can audit that very quickly. So what I would say is unit testing is as much of a detection scheme for coupling as anything else. You can make decouple code, and it's not too hard, but you have to fiddle around with the tools. So I've told more of a story than going into the details, and if you're ever curious, we could focus on an individual part here, but I think the context was more important than the actual places to go to. And if you know how to get started, you can figure out how to build on this. So I want to quit early. How's that sound? That's fair. You asked for uh, your uh, repository class, took the context as a parameter, but it did not take an interface. Yep. There are some things that we've argued about on design in terms of where things should be. You don't need interfaces every place. And so there's <laughs> been an awful lot of discussion where you need interfaces. And one of the things that we were doing and try to do is we've set up a system, for example, unit of work. Traditionally, you have a unit of work to be a context for a database save, to be transactional. In other words, you, you grab some data, you munch it, you change it, you add to it, and there's this chain set behind it. And then at the very end, you say save, or you don't say save, and it will all happen as a unit, and so the saves in the unit of work. Well, what happens if a transaction is going to be also a service update, or you've got two databases at the same time and you want to have transactional? We've actually set some things up right now. So we have really a unit of work hierarchy, and it turns out the save actually spins through all the things attached to it. So we've done some goofy things behind the scenes, but what you're using is all hidden and wrapped, if that makes some sense. So the question is, application code, you really want to hide away. Infrastructure, sometimes you can cheat, but then you've got lots of eyes on the code. I don't know if that's a, if that's a wishy-washy answer or if that's satisfactory. It's the same discussion I've had with myself. On, you, you, do you expose it or not? Right, and, and what we tend to do is at the application level, we do not expose it. Back behind the scenes in the infrastructure, we lower it because it makes it simpler, and simple is usually good. As soon as it gets too complicated or looks like something we can't control, then you better wrap it. So I would say often don't put interfaces until you know you need them. So like anytime you're having modules talking to separate modules or DLLs, if you've separated them that way, they ought to be talking through interfaces to keep it decoupled. Um, unless your interface is something like definitions, you know, interfaces or POCO objects or whatever, in which case, well, you know, you talk to them directly because they're your shared information. Um, so what's within interfaces, you can restrict an awful lot and you can make different decisions. But when you're talking about t working between groups or multiple groups or working between subsystems and such, in particular when you're talking about isolated services and systems, all of those need hard layers. Some of the structural things, I would say you can relax, but always watch because those are the danger points. Okay, so I gave a wissy whiz answer for, for a specific question, but it all depends. And most of the time is what are the consequences and can you live with it? And if you know what you're doing, you shouldn't be in trouble. If you don't know what you're doing, you're just doing it blindly, that's when all sorts of troubles happen. And you also notice I didn't talk about threading. And there's all these new thread libraries and things, and there's a whole set of hurts that can happen if you're not careful. And, and that's one I don't want to discuss here because that's a different story, but it turns out that that's one where some of these designs have some fragile points. Any other questions? Sorry, you notice every question is going to a long answer. That's not a threat. Okay, then I'd say that's good enough. Everybody's sitting there going, I don't want to ask a question. Thank you for coming.